passage. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. But to help us understand the message, I, I, I want to share a story that happened nearly 40 years ago. It's very tragic. There was a, a teenage girl, she was 13 years old, and she was walking to a carnival. And like anybody that would be walking to a carnival, a teenager, she was expecting to have a fun, exciting, great time. Meet some friends, do some things. And as she was walking to the carnival, there was a drunk driver that was driving and swerved out of control and hit this young girl. Her name was Carrie Leitner, and she tragically died. The word devastating does not begin to describe the effect that this incident had on the mother of Carrie Leitner. And as Carrie's mom, Candy, was, was processing this, emotions were all over the place, as you can imagine. And she's processing, well, what happened that, that her daughter's gone? She made this decision. This decision that she wouldn't let this tragic, terrible event make her bitter and angry, although that would be totally understandable. She decided as she processed through this event, she decided that she was going to make something good come from this terribly bad thing. And in 1982, a couple years after this happened, she found an organization that you may have heard of. It's called Mothers Against Drunk Driving. You guys heard of that organization? Since then, since then, she's partnered with numerous organizations. She's uh, talked to numerous government officials. They've had legislation. They've had all these things. And 40 years later, literally the year 40 years ago it was started, drunk driving deaths are down 50% versus 40 years ago. 50%. And a lot of that, can be traced back to an individual that decided to take a trial and a difficulty and view it differently and process it differently. And because she viewed it differently and responded to this differently, something good has happened. I think we can all be honest in the room and we can say this, that we don't like hard times in life. We don't like trials and tribulations. I personally like life to be very easy. I want life to be as simple as possible. Now, sometimes in life, we experience really big trials, really, really hard things. And sometimes they're not as big, but they're still a trial. Like, for example, in the last month, uh, both Gina and I have had our cars that were parked in a parking lot, had somebody hit our cars and leave. And in the last month, we have both joined the fraternity of people that have experienced a hit and run. Twice, two separate cars in one month. What? And we all experienced trials. Some are big, some are small. But today in the text, what we're going to really wrestle with, and I want you to wrestle with, is, is really this question is what if we have the wrong view of trials and tribulations? What if we have the wrong view of trials and tribulations? And here's why I say this, and here's why this is incredibly important. Because the framework we see our trials through will determine our view. And will determine how we experience our trials and tribulations. Isn't it interesting how you can talk to two different people that went to the exact, that went through the very similar situations, but they came out completely differently on the other side? How did that happen? It's how they viewed their trial. And if we have the right framework to our trials, the right way to view them, it's going to change how we experience them. Now, I want to kind of illustrate this and show this to you guys with this whiteboard as far as how we, um, how we frame our trials oftentimes. 
I think we have um, a picture up on the screen of this as well. I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to be excited when I get a handheld mic, because this thing is tough right here, right? <laughs> stay. Yay, it stayed. Now, a lot of times uh, when we have trials, I'll back this up a little bit. A lot of times when we have trials, we don't just see trials alone. We see them through a framework. Like sometimes when we have a trial, what we see them through is we see them through the pain. Like it hurts really bad, right? Sometimes when we have a trial, we see it through, this is hard. Like, man, this is like really difficult. This is really uncomfortable. Sometimes when we have a trial, you name the trial, you name the difficulty. It could be different for different people, right? A a freshman in high school, a trial is going to be a little different for them than somebody that's middle-aged, but it's a trial nonetheless. Sometimes we have a trial and we see it through the lens of overwhelming. Like now mentally, we're just all over the place. Emotionally, we're all over the place. Um, it's just physically overwhelming. We're staying awake at night. Sometimes when we have a trial, we see it through the lens of confusion. Have you ever had something happen to you, and you're like, why did this happen? You ever had something happen to you, and it was not your fault at all, and you're like, why? And maybe that's like the question you constantly ask, what is going on? Why is this happening? What? And a lot of times, and this is very normal, we, may, we view our trials through a lens of one of these words. Or maybe a word like this. And maybe it's a combination of pain, confusion, overwhelming, this is difficult. Or maybe for you, based on your experiences and your background and where you're from, maybe one of these words describe your entire framework for a trial. So when you experience a trial, you just feel overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed. You just can't take it. And what can happen is we view our trial through a certain framework, and that determines how we experience our trial. And if we can have the right framework for our trial, by the way, this is a normal framework, but there's a Christ-centered framework we're going to see in a minute. If we can have the right framework for our trial, it it would change everything. In fact, it would allow us in the midst of a trial to still have strength and still have stability and still have mental health and still have purpose in the midst of the trial. Now, some of you are thinking, there's no way I can have strength and purpose in these things in the midst of a trial because all of my trials are just so overwhelming. They're just so hard. We're in this series entitled Pictures of Grace and Today, what we have is we have a a magnifying glass. This is our picture today. In fact, when you leave today, every one of you is going to get a magnifying glass exactly like this. Who thought that when you were going to church today, you were going to get a present? Anybody thought that? Only at First Christian Church do you get presents for coming to church. It cost about, they cost about a dime each on Amazon. I know we're big spenders here. Um, This is what we're going to see today. That if you will view your trial... Through the right lens. Through the right framework. It's going to change how you experience every hard season of life. And for some of you, today's message might be the most important message you've ever heard here. And I don't just say that lightly. Because today you are going to learn and you're going to discover from God's word how the right framework will lead you to strength, stability, and purpose in the midst of trials. Are you ready to learn that today? Would you say amen? amen. All right, let's look at the scripture. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 1. This is what, this is what Paul writes uh, to a church at Ephesus. This is what Paul says. Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles... For this reason, what he's talking about is what he had just written about in Ephesians chapter 2. The message we talked about last week, the reason was that in Christ we are one. Because of Christ we're reconciled with God. He says, for this reason, him sharing this, he says he's the prisoner of Christ Jesus. So he's about to explain some things that he's experienced. He's about to explain some things that are happening. And he's saying, the reason why is because I have shared with you about Christ. 
So because of this, I am now, he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, what's fascinating is he was a prisoner under the Roman authority. But he sees himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And he says, I'm a prisoner on behalf of you Gentiles. Remember, Gentiles means non-Jewish people. This is for you. So I'm in this situation. I'm in this situation because I've told all of you guys in the world that Jesus reconciles us with God. He brings us together. Now I'm a prisoner. Yes, I'm under Roman authority, but really it's I'm a prisoner of Christ. And I'm doing this for you. Verse number two. Assuming you've heard about the administration of God's grace that he gave me for you. He gave me this for you. This trial is about you that I'm in prison. Can you explain that a little more, Paul? Explain this. Verse 3. The mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have briefly written above. The mystery is the gospel of what Jesus does, of who Jesus is, as he's told them earlier. He got, when did he get this insight? When did he, when was this revealed to him in the midst of the trial? Verse number four, by reading this, you're able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So he's in the prison, he's in this trial, and God's taught him things. And now he's able to teach others things. Remember that. It says in, in verse, number, uh, verse number five, this was not made known to people in other generations as is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Gentiles are co-heirs, right? We're unified. Members of the same body and partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So when we trust in the gospel in what Jesus has done for us, we are one. We are together. We are unified. It's not you're this political party and you're that political party and you like this sports team and you like that sports team. No, no. He says we are one. Now, it's really, you think about this text in verse 6. He literally is just telling him the exact same thing he told him at the, at the end of chapter 2. Or end, of, end of chapter 2. And he went on and on about it. I almost didn't say this, right? But it's just, there, I have to say this, okay? Sometimes we don't need to learn new things. We need to be reminded of and apply the things we already know. Amen. Literally, seven, eight verses ahead of the to- ahead, Paul just showed them all these things. And then Paul's like, let me just remind you of this. You know what can happen if you've been in church for a while, if you've been following Jesus for a while? Is you can know all this stuff about God. In fact, some of you guys, there's nothing I, I can teach you that you don't already know. In fact, some of you sit there like, teach me something new. Just kidding. You know it. But it's not what do we know, but what are we doing with what we know? And could it be that we're immature in our faith? Possibly, maybe. And we think, I just need to learn more. I... And really what we need to do is apply what we've already learned. The greatest gap in the Christian life is the gap between knowing and doing. Come on, Gordon. That's my boy right there, right? (laughs) The greatest gap in the Christian life is the gap between knowing and doing. So here's my question. What are we doing with what we already know? And what's preventing us from applying what we already know? This is what Paul says. I just want to remind you guys. I want to remind you guys that the Gentiles are co-heirs. They're members of the same body. Yeah, I know I told you guys that eight verses ago, but you didn't obviously didn't get all of it, so I need to tell it to you again. Verse number seven. He says, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace. That was given to me by the working of his power. When I understood the gospel, I became a servant of it. When I understood the power of this gospel message, and he says, I was made a servant. Okay, God chose him, but he surrendered to God's calling. So God wanted him to serve. He realizes the gospel. He sees what this is about, and then he chooses to serve. It was the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. 
you realize when you're serving God, and serving doesn't just mean being on a serve team on Sunday, although that's part of it, but when you're serving your family and trying to point them to Jesus, you know God's working in you, and God's working on your behalf, and you feel frustrated, and you're like, am I making a difference at all? No, 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 God's working. By the working of his power, verse 8, this grace was given to me, the least of all saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ. I want, to, I want people to know, like people are knowing about Christ, and to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. I don't know if you guys noticed this right here, but in verse number seven, he said he was made a servant of this gospel. You guys remember, where, 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 where's he writing this from? Writing this from prison. prison. Okay. So let me get this straight. Paul was serving God, and it led him into the prison. I don't know about you guys, but if I was in prison, I think prison would be a pretty big trial and tribulation. Pretty big one. So, serving God led him into a trial and tribulation. Huh. You guys ever thought about this? If you follow Jesus, it will lead you into some trials and tribulations. Let's say you're at work. And they say, hey, it's not a big deal, but I just, I just need you to lie about this right here. It's not a big deal, but just, just sign this paper and just lie about this. You say, man, I'm, I'm a Christ follower. I, you know, I value integrity. This really matters to me. I just, I can't do that. Like, oh, no, no, you want to sign this. Because if you sign this, this will kind of uh, make some things happen. And there's promotions that are coming down the road. And why don't you sign this? And then you say, no, 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 I can't do that because I'm a Jesus follower. And so because you do the right thing instead of the wrong thing, then maybe you don't get the promotion or maybe you don't have the reputation that is needed to succeed. And following Jesus led you into a trial. What about this? Maybe you're in a dating relationship with somebody. And they say, hey, hey, if you don't sleep with me, it's over. Like, if you don't sleep with me, like, our relationship is over. And, and you really like this person. You really care about, like, you see a future with this person. But you have decided that you're going to follow God's design. You're going to follow Jesus in his design for sex within the bounds of marriage. And they say, no, no, no. If you don't, then it's over. And you make the decision to say, I'm standing with Jesus and I'm following him with this important area of my life. And that person says, okay, relationship is over. And you experience the trial of being alone and feeling forsaken because you followed Jesus. You know, that sometimes when you follow Jesus, it will actually lead you into a trial. But get this, we don't follow Jesus. We don't follow Jesus to make life better, but because he's better than life. Is that up there? Yeah. I, I was expecting a little better reaction. Okay, let's try this again, right? We don't follow Jesus to make life better, but because he's better than life. Amen. That's right. Like, that is why we follow Jesus. In Timothy, this is what Paul writes. He says that um, anybody that follows Jesus will suffer persecution. Like, as a Christ follower, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. In moments, our faith will be tested. But in moments when obeying Jesus might lead us into a difficult situation, you have to ask yourself this question. Am I following Jesus just to make my life better or because he's better than life? Now I'll say, I think following Jesus will make your life better. I think make your life a whole lot better. Like, my marriage is, I'm so thankful that Jesus is in the center. Like, it's, it's great. And it's, but if the sole reason why we follow Jesus is to make our life better, instead of the fact that he's better than life, we're going to tap out and say, I don't know about this. But what can happen when we experience trials and bad things? And verse 10, let me, let me get through this and let's look at this right framework. And then we're going to hear from somebody in our church that has experienced a hard trial. 
Verse 10, it says, This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. This is according to his eternal purposes, purpose accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's purposes are being accomplished through my trials, he says. Verse 12, in him we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. So then I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are your glory. He says, guys, I'm in a bad situation. Things aren't good for me. Things aren't good for me. But God's purposes are happening. So for the rest of the message, this is what we're going to do. Just take some things right out of the text. And we're going to look at Paul's framework for this trial. And we're going to present this, tr- this framework through four questions that you can ask. And if you will see it through this framework that we see from Paul, it's going to change how you view trials. And I have to say this before we get into it, before we ask these four questions, is sometimes it is God's will for you to be in a trial. Like sometimes God actually ordains trials because trials mature us. But there are other times where we're in trials and it is not God's will. Now, let me explain the difference. When we follow God and we are living for God's purposes under God's design, and we or somebody else goes outside of God's purposes, outside of God's design, and they do things that hurt people, maybe we do something that hurts us, or somebody does something to hurt people, and it causes a trial, that is something that is outside of God's design and outside of God's will. But let me say this, in those situations, God can still redeem that trial. Okay? So here's the questions that we have to ask. Okay? First of all, first question, first question for the right framework is this. Is who can I help? I'm going to put this up here. Say, who... Can I help in this trial? In these verses, Paul talks about that this was for you. Paul wasn't in the prison for himself, but because it was through the prison that other people were going to be helped and grow in their faith. And sometimes God will allow you to experience some things, and they're not even for you. They're because down the road, you're going to cross paths with somebody else that's experiencing the same thing, and you're going to be able to help them. Now, I know some of you are hearing that, and you're, that's not very good news for you. Like, right now, you're just mad. You're like, why do you mean this is for somebody else? <sighs> but sometimes we're in trials that are not for us, but they're for others. Paul's in prison, not for him. He says, I'm here for you. There's a verse that I want to put on the screen, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 4, that some of you need to claim right now in your life. It's really going to help. It says this, he, that's God, he comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. That God comforts us when we're in a hard time. Why, 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 why? So we can comfort others. Here's the first question. Who can I help through this trial? Like, who am I going to be able to help? And maybe it's not right now, but maybe it's in six months from now or two years from now. Here's the second question. What can I learn about God through this trial? What can I learn about God through this trial? Verses 3 and 4. He talks about how things were revealed to him through the trial. Now I want to ask you guys a question. Who in this room? You don't have to raise your hand, but just think about it. Who wants to grow in their relationship with God? Most of you guys are like, yeah, I do, right? That's, That's why I'm here, okay? And by the way, even if you you don't raise your hand, say, I don't really want to, I'm still glad that you're here. Like, you're very glad you're here. You say you want to go in your relationship with God. Did you know that pain is often the path to growth in the Christian life? Like, trials are often the path to growth in the Christian life. How are you going to know that God is truly trustworthy until you're in situations where you have to trust them in very, very deep ways? How are you going to discover that? How are you going to discover that the joy of the Lord is your strength and can be your strength until you experience a season when you don't have any strength at all? 
How, how, can you, how can you learn that God will faithfully be there for you if you don't experience a time of loss? How do you experience, how will you ever experience that God's a God of comfort if you're not in a season of life where you're completely uncomfortable? How can you learn that God truly can give you peace that passes all understanding if you don't experience a season of life that's really confusing? How? We can't. And, and, and the trials that we're in, this is what we have to ask ourselves. What can I learn about God? Next question, number three. How can I make Jesus known through this trial? In verses 7 through 9, Paul talks about how he became a servant. He talks about how the gospel went forward. You know, when we're in situations and seasons of trials, it often puts us around people that we wouldn't be around otherwise if it was not for the trial. Right? Like, for example, so I got to go uh, to the car place. I got to go to the car shop. And I had to call insurance. I had to do all this stuff because, you know, we had the hit and run or whatever. So now what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to go to a car auto body place that I do not want to go. And I'm going to talk to three or four people there. And there might be two or three people that are sitting there in the lobby. And that is an opportunity for me to be around people I wouldn't be around otherwise. And by the way, let's be honest. I wish I didn't have to be around them, right? I wish I didn't have to go to that. But that is an opportunity in that situation for me to say, okay, Lord, how can I make you known in this situation? Because this is what will happen. The trials that you're in will put you around people that you aren't usually around. And whenever we're around people, it's stewardship. It's an opportunity to say, okay, Lord, how can I steward this situation? How can I steward the people that you have around me? How can I make Jesus known? And then number four, here's the fourth question for our framework is this is how can I further God's purposes? How can I further God's purposes? If you're following Jesus just to make your life better, when you experience a trial, you're going to get upset or angry or bitter. But if you're following Jesus to let him do his work in you, to let him do his work in you, you will see trials as an opportunity for God's purposes to be furthered. For God's purposes to be furthered. What is God's purposes? That more people will know Jesus. Maybe, maybe you in this room, like, you're in a trial right now, and you got a friend or a family member that doesn't know Jesus, and you've been praying for them, and they're watching how you go through this trial. And because you go through it with gentleness and grace and faith, that's going to influence them. God's purposes is that our lives will be more like Jesus. You know, trials really humble us. Gosh, they humble us. Man, they, 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 they humble us and they cause us to, uh, to realize that, that we don't have a lot. And you know what Jesus was? Jesus was gentle and humble. And trials can cause us to rely on God in greater ways and seek him in deep ways. And that's so important. This is why every, every month as a, as a church, the first Thursday of every month, we have a monthly prayer meeting. And now we have, we have some worship at it now. So it's just a, a monthly prayer and worship night. And it's going to be the first Thursday, July 7th of next month. And we're going to do it up in the new youth room. And this is what it's going to be. It's going to be about an hour or so. And as a church, we're going to seek God. And what we're going to do is we're going to pray for one another. We're going to beg God to work. And I'll tell you what, many of you have spoken to me recently about things that God's doing in our church. And you're like, wow, this is awesome. Wow, this is great. Oh, man, we're praying for those things on, on the first Thursday of every month. And God is working in our midst man we we want to say god how can i further your purposes in the trial so here's my question will you view your trial through this framework every one of you in this room have a framework to how you view trials you see it somehow. But how you experience your trials determines the framework through which you view it through. Who can I help? What can I learn about God? How can I make Jesus known and how can I further God's purposes? We're going to end this way. I'm going to ask um, Joan Parker to come to the stage right now. Where's Joan? Joan's somewhere. In fact, can we do this? As Joan comes to the stage, can we welcome Joan to the stage? Because it's really scary to come up here. (laughs) 
she's going to give the short version of her story, the short version of her story, the three-minute version of her story, of how she was given a cancer diagnosis with a 95% mortality rate and had a 5% chance of living. And what she learned in that trial and tribulation. Joan, thank you. I have to follow the notes because otherwise I'd talk for hours. Um, Pastor Nate asked me to share some of the story of the most important growing experiences I've had in my life. I've had quite a few, but this one pretty big. Back in 2002 and 2003, we were a very busy family. In addition to taking care of our kids and my in-laws, our jobs, two house remodels, and some volunteer work, I had the unexpected opportunity to learn about oncology. There's a long story behind it all, but to suffice it to say that although I had prayed for healing of a medical problem that I'd struggled with for years, peritoneal cancer was not what I was expecting to be the cure. Peritoneal cancer is very rare. As of 2003, it did have a 5% survival rate. And yes, that does mean a 95% death rate. Peritoneal cancer is like ovarian cancer, except that it starts in the lining of the abdomen, it spreads from there. Both cancers are more deadly than others because often there are no symptoms until it's stage four. I was at stage three C. I don't know what the C stands for. There were many people who were involved in my recovery. Our Sunday school class and the whole church, to be honest, were praying for me and our whole family because cancer was not the only trial we got to grow through that year. I also had reached out to friends all over the world to ask for prayer and pray they did. Prayer is an amazingly powerful gift to give someone going through a trial. You don't always know who you'll touch when you go through trials. There were lots of people involved in my experience in some way or another. But one person was truly amazed and encouraged at my recovery, and that was my oncologist, since so many of her patients didn't make it. I did my best to point out God's faithfulness to me every time I went back for follow-up treatments during the next five years. I, I, her statement as she said goodbye to me is, oh, honey, you're golden. <laughs> that just warmed my heart, too. As to what I learned through this trial about God, well, at least five things. The first being that God uses events like this to answer prayers. It's not always the way you might expect or wish for. Believe me, I would never have chosen that. <laughs> But I can tell you now that having a total hysterectomy to remove cancer cells does indeed cure PMS symptoms. <laughs> I know the people who are laughing right now. <laughs> Second, God clarified my attitude about life. My mom, who spent years fighting diabetes, had a button on her desk which read, I'm not dead. I finally understood the purpose of her button, but I wanted a more positive way saying that I would, a more positive saying that would help me focus my mind on being alive and not get caught up in the probable death scenario. So I started telling myself, I am going to live until I die, and then I'll live again. My life is his, and I want to use it for his purposes, whatever they may be every day until he calls me home. Third, Satan wants us to live in fear and worry. But that's not God's plan. Believe me, cancer and the potential death from it can cause worry. During that time, I spent a lot of time meditating on Matthew 6, 27, which says, and which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? When fear hit, and it did, although amazingly not that often, thanks to the prayers of many, but when it hit, it hit hard. And I would ask myself, 
Why pray when you can worry? Or, come on, Joan, why worry when you can pray? Fear and anxiety soon became a trigger to pray, and not just to pray for myself. Prayer disabled the power of fear. Fourth, there is a lot of joy to be found in looking for how God is blessing you. Since then, I've paid a lot more attention to the details that he works out in my life. Remembering the details of his faithfulness in the past has helped me face many other trials as they came my way. I spent a lot of time in the midst of the cancer treatment focusing on his blessings. Before the cancer trial, I had started a jar of stones of remembrance based on the story in Joshua chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, of how God commanded Joshua and the Israelites to take up 12 stones from the river as they walked across on dry land to their new home so that they would remember how God had cut off the waters of the Jordan before the Ark of the Covenant. My stones are in a jar so that like the Israelites, I can answer my children in the time to come when they ask, what do those stones mean to you? In 2003, I had a peanut butter jar filled with items that reminded me of God's faithfulness. I've added to it since that time, requiring me to find a larger jar. This is my jar now. I'm happy to note that it has room to add more things because he continues to be uh, faithful. And most specifically, from number five, I've realized that trials are not punishment. Although we can create our own trials as natural consequences to our sins, God has a way of taking them and using them to refine our lives for his purpose. I've learned nothing, nothing is wasted by God. So now, facing a trial no longer wields terror. In 2003, there was a song by Jenny Owens playing on the radio that really helped me go through the cancer trial. It was called, If You Want Me To. Here's the first line. The pathway is broken. The signs are unclear. And I don't know the reason why you've brought me here. But just because you love me the way that you do, I'm going to walk through the valley if you want me to. Sorry, it brings back emotions. I encourage you to keep walking through any valley that God has brought your way because he will go there with you every step of the way. And he will make it into something beautiful in the end. As our worship team comes to the stage, maybe it's not cancer for you, maybe it is. But what is the trial that you're facing right now? What are you going through right now that you need to have the right framework for? What is it that you're experiencing that you need to have that perspective of of Joan? Could it be that if we have the right framework that 5, 10, 15, maybe 20 years later, while it may not be on a stage like this, you can have a similar story to Joan? Let's have a word of prayer together. Thank you. 